Well, we're back to exploring in depth the Sutta on Great Blessings, the Mangala Sutta. This is a treasure trove of advice for lay people and uh, monastics as well. And uh, we are fully taking time, six days, to extrapolate all of the possibilities out of it and uh, to understand how to improve the quality of one's life and what actually does improve the quality of one's life <clears throat> and so that you can put effort and energy into that. So, uh, Pia, let's start with our first question. Ajahn, our first question is from the live stream from Ananda. Ajahn, what advice do you have on balancing care for family with care for self? Should meditators prioritize practice time or family time or find a balance? Well, I think we have to understand uh, that sometimes it's mutually a blessing. So when we take time for ourselves and use it well for meditation and just uh, rest sometimes, it is a gift to the family. That it, it is a blessing for your family. If you don't take care of yourself, I guess one of the great tragedies is, is somebody who doesn't take care of themselves. If if one is a mother and then and is always at the end of her rope and so forth, and then the child grows up and think looks back and said, "Oh, my poor mother," you know, she was just uh, worn out at both ends. So she she uh, was always tired and and on edge. So that's, that's not a pleasant memory to have. So whether mothers like it or not, they do have to rest and, and of course, to improve their, uh, their sense of well-being and, and temperament is it, they need to have a vision of life, something that uplifts them. And meditation should be that. It's, it's, it is a, a possibility of calming. It is a possibility of restoring energy but also we have to reflect so that we have themes in our life that make us ready to face the day. Uh, of course, the Dhamma is very good for this. Uh, it is uh, more or less shockproofing you so that you don't overblow minor things, that you don't worry unnecessarily. And in fact, that you strive to not worry, period because ultimately worry is unnecessary. It doesn't mean that you don't act uh, to take care of things that need taking care of. And, but it is, lots of people spend a lot of time being very nervous about anything going wrong. They are more or less over responsible. And so we have to relax and say, you know, whether I like it or not, things the world it, it is out of control. I, but I must remain centered, equanimous, and compassionate in the midst of this. And then there's the activity of looking after family, and that is a blessed or yourself is a blessing, and to look after family is uh, a blessing as well. And we have to come at, at it that way, rather than a darned duty that we have to do. We have to just change it in our mind and say, well, you know, I chose to get into this and I'm in this situation and I really want to make the best of it. And I don't want to look back and think, I, I, I was unnecessarily resentful of things. I do have uh, mothers that come to me and uh, talk about children in the difficult stages of their lives, but I I often remind them, you know, okay, well, just uh, realize that it's only going to last a few years, you know, scratching up the, uh, the table in the living room and all this kind of stuff is just get rid of the table at the end of it and get the table that you actually want. But in the meantime, just realize it's just stuff and they're just uh, in this phase of their life which shall pass and remarkably... It never lasts. These phases don't usually last for more than a couple of years at a time. So you have to keep that in mind all the time, not to take it too seriously. So uh, that's important that 
this is the nature, the com complex nature of humans as they grow from age one to 20. And so this is staying light, staying with a sense of humor, taking care of yourself and feeling it is a blessing to take care of others, but realizing at the same time that ultimately you can't cover all of these situations. You can't make everybody ultimately safe. Life is uh, careening a little bit out of control and you just have to relax sometimes. So that's the attitude to both of those things, taking care of yourself and taking care of family and the balance between those two. Pia. Ajahn, our next question is from Anonymous in Alberta, Canada. How can I continue to have metta towards my sister who takes my things when I'm not around without asking me? I don't want to be a passive spectator and be taken advantage of. Is this also an opportunity for me to let go of my attachment to things? Well, I think it you might be mistaken about what metta is. Metta doesn't approve of your sister stealing your stuff. <laughs> metta, uh, it can be very strong. So because you like your things and your sister is not entitled to your things. So loving kindness means that you, that your sister doesn't get to take your things. And that you might have to have a very face to face talk with her and say, look, don't take my things. And that doesn't mean that you're angry at her or anything like that. It means that you care about yourself and you care about her. And it's certainly not a good habit for her to be just uh, stepping over the boundaries of your possessions. Because even if, it, if you are her sister, it still doesn't mean that your stuff is her stuff. <laughs> so don't think of it as a reduction of metta Think it of, of it as metta. Metta makes you strong enough to tell clearly people when they're stepping over the boundaries. And you should have clear boundaries for yourself that make you feel comfortable in relationships to your family and others. And that is taking good care of yourself. That is being your own good mother. And you have to speak in the voice of a mother to your sister and say, now look here, dear that stuff is not yours. You, you stay with your own stuff. <laughs> okay, next question. Ajahn, our next question is from a live feed from Jenny Pai. Longpur, would you kindly expound a bit on the relationship of blessings, quote, the making of merit, unquote, and future kama? Well, blessings, yeah. These things which we bring to our life, and we've enumerated in, in these talks, uh, and there is a, a full talk coming tonight as well and tomorrow. So we will get through this whole long list of blessings. Uh, so they are something that you bring in intentionally into your life. You sustain them, you practice them, you deepen them, you get skillful with them. And because of the nature of what is called karma, and this is the central teaching of Buddhism, is that they have positive results in the future. So this is, um, as I give this talk, or these series of talks, I'm trying to be very inclusive to a large audience, because whether one uh, believes in or understands what is called karma, cause and effect, in the moral dimension, uh, these things, these be blessings will benefit your life, whether you uh, understand the, the karmic results or not. But for those who are uh, Buddhist uh, and are aware of this idea of karma, the benefits blossom and massively accrue uh, in exponential numbers. The universe is more or less a magnifying mirror. Whatever you put into it comes back amplified. If you put in a small act of kindness and generosity, it actually comes back a thousandfold, a millionfold, or incalculably. So this is kind of like the, the law of seeds, you know, this 
a small seed produces a tree which produces immense amounts of fruit. So a ver from a very tiny um, act, great uh, results come. And it can be in the positive direction and it can be in the negative direction. So we, we're very concerned and careful not to do negative things because the results can be amplified and come back in, in large ways. Uh, but we are, this is now we understand the economy of the universe as well. So positive actions uh, produce abundant and super abundant fruit. And this is something to, to keep in mind. It's a good motivator. And, but we, we don't even have to um, know about it or realize it. It's kind of like the, the laws of, uh, of gravity. Uh, we don't have to know about the laws of gravity. If we uh, parachute out of a plane, uh, I assure you that the, the laws of gravity will take effect. And you don't have to have passed grade 11 physics to know that. <laughs> you might have no sense of the, the, the laws of the physics, but the laws nevertheless take place. And this is the nature of uh, karma. It's it, it regarded from a Buddhist perspective as a kind of a, a law of the universe. And uh, whether you know about them or not, they act. If you know about them, that's all the better. And you can really focus on uh, the benefit for yourself and others by putting in these positive causes. So let's go on next. Our next question is from Laura in Ohio, United States. Dear Ajahn, I am a th psychotherapist and as a Buddhist and as my Buddhist practice has deepened, more and more what I offer to my clients is rooted in the Dhamma, without necessarily calling it that. It feels like a blessing to share the teachings I have learned. However, I sometimes feel awkward about charging for my services. Is this a violation of right livelihood? No, I think you should feel very comfortable, Laura, in um, charging for your, your, uh, your time. Uh, monks... Uh, have committed themselves to a, a system of livelihood called alms mendicant, and we don't charge for our advice, but uh, lay people uh, need to make a livelihood. So uh, unless you're independently wealthy and can afford to just uh, see patients for free, uh, or what do they call them today? Uh, clients for free. <laughs> uh, then you're going to have to charge for that. And it's perfectly good to, to get... Dhamma in any form can be a wonderfully healing thing, and it's worth it. It's incalculable, or it's it's priceless. Let's put it that way. So one of the reasons monks don't charge particularly for it is because it's priceless, <laughs> and we are we are passing it along, and that's the agreement we make when we go into the sanghas is to not uh, not charge for the, the dhamma. But that doesn't apply to lay people who are teaching. They need, if you're going to do that duty, and by the way, in the West, there are not enough monastics to cover the needs, to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with people. I, 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 I say that I've had more than 10,000 interviews with people one-on-one, -on -one, and it's, it's probably a great deal more than that. And... Uh, that's a lot of interviews for one person, and uh, so I can't I can't cover the field. Uh, uh, lay people, if you're if you're competent and qualified and and uh, well instructed in this dhamma, I encourage you to share the dhamma however you can with others. And if you're a professional, then feel free to uh, charge for it because it's worth it to the person's life to to feel. To get out from under unnecessary burdens, misunderstandings about the world by consulting one-on-one -on -one with a with a psychologist or psychotherapist is worth everything. So feel free to uh, to be be paid for this. And previously, I said about social workers who are asked to to take on all of these clients that they should be paid twice as much as they are and work half the number of hours. And I also feel this for psychotherapists that I, I talk to people one-on-one -on -one sometimes, uh, you know, every day, three or four people in a row, and that's enough. And I also take time off where I don't talk to people. And 
a psychotherapist, it's it's not you're not being a, it's not a, being a carpenter. You're you're talking to this complex thing called a human being. That can be draining. I'm not sure that that I'm not sure that a therapist should take on so many clients. And if they don't take on so many clients, they need to charge quite a bit to to make a livelihood. So I think it's fine to be well paid, but not to work too many hours. So our our dear therapist doesn't get burnt out or drained either. They need to be kept well and happy and peaceful so that they can keep going with others and keep them well, happy and peaceful. Okay. Our next question is from Anonymous in Oregon, United States. How does one go about asking for a blessing chant from a monk? Is there a formal way to request for this? I just found out I have cancer. I don't have a lot of details yet and probably won't until after the holiday. I have been estranged from my family, but I love them very much. Any advice? Uh, yes, just uh, email us at the monastery here and please just tell us you're, you're not well, uh, you're, you have a medical issue, and please uh, radiate meta for me. Uh, that's, that's all you need to do. And it helps if you send us a picture of you as well. We put you on the, the uh, uh, by the Buddha image, the, the mantle of the Buddha image, the, uh, in an area where we have a f quite a few people who are ill and request loving kindness and chanting for them. So we're, we're happy to do this for you. And there's no charge or anything for this. And we don't have to have ever met you in life or anything. But it's nice to have a picture of you. So we can bring you to mind and radiate full loving kindness. Uh, uh, also, we have a couple of talks called How the Wise See Cancer. <laughs> and it's on the YouTube channel. And uh, it's conversations with uh, with. Uh, Pia Dasi, who uh, had cancer, and uh, how to approach it, and uh, the effects of loving kindness and meditation on, on the situation as well. So it's something that we do a lot. Uh, cancer is just endemic to the modern world. And it is, I have had hundreds of people with cancer write to me or come and see me, and I, I do a regular loving kindness radiation this is this is the radiation that doesn't hurt <laughs> that only feels good <laughs> so we would be happy to radiate loving kindness for you but just just tell ask us tell us your name and send us a picture and we will we will proceed immediately <laughs> yeah <clears throat> ajan our next question is from anonymous in california my mom refuses to take financial help from me in her living situation, but she really needs it. I had to hide the true cost of her caretaking fees. I feel that sometimes it puts me in a territory of not right speech. What should I do about this, especially when dealing with someone who becomes increasingly difficult to reason with as one ages and loses the mental capacity to evaluate the situation properly? Yeah, you have to walk the fine line of not telling absolute lies, but uh, not always blurting out the the truth, which is unbeneficial. So somehow or another, you have to supplement her her income or her her need the need for medical uh, assistance. And just to keep in mind just before you go and see her every time. So this, this happens again and again. I've seen this with uh, people who are, you know, adults and their, their parents are in late age and they're starting to decline in mental health and maybe get a little Alzheimer's. And, I, and they, of course, they get, the, they get the diagnosis. Oh, your, your mother has Alzheimer or your, you know, your father's declining. Oh, yes. And they'll say strange things and they'll forget things and so forth. Uh, just be, just be aware that they're, it's not intentional, and then you see them uh, go and visit their parents, and s ten minutes in, they get annoyed with their parents because they ask the same question eight times, and and they're stubborn and they won't listen and all this kind of stuff, and then you forget. Oh yes, she has Alzheimer's. 
So the key is just before you enter the room, you, you sit down for a minute and just say, now, I'm not talking to my mother as I knew her. I'm not talking to my father as I knew him. He and she are no longer that person. This person is in need of help, just like a child is in need of help. And children don't know exactly what to say and when to say it. And once you have a decline in mental and cognitive fac uh, faculties, you don't know what's appropriate to say. And of course, you know this. Everybody knows this, but because it's your mother and you got such a huge history, a very rich and entwined history, you, you keep forgetting that it, it is your mother, but it's not your mother anymore. So that's the little one minute meditation before visiting your mother, uh, if she has al Alzheimer's or so forth. Say, now come on here. I'm, it's not my good old mom talking to me. It's, uh, there's a decline in, in mental uh, acuity, etc. And it's not intentional. She's not trying to bother me or bug me uh, or annoy me. She's not trying to do that. And so I, I need to remember that through the conversation. And if you start slipping, then just step out for a, a minute again. Just go off to the washroom or something and splash some cold water in his face and say, oh yes, I forgot. Now, let's get back to this. There's no need to be impatient or irritable with them because they are not doing, they're not trying to annoy you consciously. But it's just a little memory device. And that's what we call mindfulness. So that is reminding ourselves that we are drifting and forgetting what, uh, who this person is and why they're speaking this way. Yeah. Ajahn, our next question is from the live feed from Sumana. Ajahn, in speaking of family duties, you stressed making this a blessing rather than a burden, and this is so helpful. With an adult child with disabilities and mental illness, the line of care is unclear sometimes. Any further comments on this kind of situation would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, I think that you have to uh, not hold out the hope that, that you'll fix everything. So this is a, an impossible burden which is put on parents. And, and, and also, you know, in, in all kinds of close relationships, like you feel like you must, you must help them, you must fix them, you must, you must, you must. But in reality, we know that it's out of our hands. Somebody else's entanglements, uh, mental structures are really not within our grasp. And we have to give up the idea that we can fix and cure everybody. And then <clears throat> it means that we can go and see them, visit them with loving kindness, think of them with loving kindness, but without the false notion that we can fix everything. We can fix everything. And we have to be, you know, all right with not fixing everything. People decline, uh, they get sick and they don't recover. And that's all right. That's nature, isn't it? It's the way, the complex nature of the human body and the human mind is that it uh, frequently goes wrong. And there is some suffering in that, but we shall not add to the suffering. We shall not add to the suffering, and but we can add to the loving kindness in the world. So we're going to stay loving, loving, but unburdened by the feeling of this, uh, some sort of overriding duty to pull off a miracle. We're not going to pull off a miracle. We're going to smile. We're going to make sure everybody's tidied up and washed their hands and been fed and stuff. And that's about all we can do. And the rest is to watch as a wise, wise person, the spectacle of what it is to be a human, to be born into this world, to be subject to the all the illnesses possible, to watch aging go by and to see 
it ends in death. And that's the, that's the wise, wise person looking on that spectacle. And we can sometimes help a little bit, sometimes not, but we can maintain a, a view of loving kindness. And this will never burn out this way. We never get exhausted this way. But we will get exhausted if, we, if we're fighting the universe, fighting the realities of mental illness, fighting the realities of physical illness. We're not in a fight with it. We accept it. That's the way it is. But we can be kind in the midst of it. Yeah. Ajahn, our next question is from the live feed from Tring Nhat. Relating to the Dhamma talk on discipline, what are the limitations of willpower? Sometimes, out of strong determination, I make my body tense during meditation. Do you have any advice? Yeah, that it's uh, typical of various uh, efforts that we make, including worldly efforts. Uh, it's if you go golfing, uh, you will strangle the the golf club, uh, and the 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 pro will make you relax and. If you try to play the guitar, you will uh, strangle the guitar and, and the, your, your teacher will make you relax and say it just enough to make the string go down. That's all you need to do. Uh, this happens playing the piano, um, sports. Uh, so we have to realize that there is right effort and wrong effort. And the wrong effort is we just increase our tension uh, or wrinkle our forehead to no avail. Sometimes this uh, this is a confusion around speech as well. So in 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 school, sometimes kids' attentions are wandering, and the teacher will sometimes say, "Concentrate." And I remember this when I was in grade two or three. They would say, "Concentrate," and I noticed that people who young kids who had glasses that they would kind of squint their eyes. And I thought that must be con that must be how you concentrate, like squint your eyes. And I th I would try squinting my eyes to make me concentrate, but it, it it had nothing to do with concentration. Like how concentration is not a physical thing. It's actually allowing the mind to focus and relax because it is interested. So the essence of meditation is interest. And the Buddha gives you some things to get interested in that aren't intrinsically interesting. So, for instance, he'll ask you to watch your breath with great interest. I mean, breath is not, the fact that you're breathing is the least interesting. It's not terrible, it's not repulsive, but it's not interesting. But you're going to actually get interested in it. And this, this, by learning to increase your interest, increases the the joy of life. Uh, with interest rises joy. So this is one of the factors of, of success in meditation. Joy and energy arise when you're interested. And it doesn't matter. You can be standing on a rainy day in the middle of a Walmart parking lot and have a good experience if you're there, if you're fully present and aware. If you're interested, you can even be joyful walking across, uh, down the, uh, the sidewalk in the asphalt city. It can be fine, but you have to realize you're the one that infuses the world with interest and joy. So that's, uh, and <clears throat> if you need an example of interest and joy, think about the best book you ever read and how you can end up reading till two in the morning, even though you need to get to sleep and go to work the next day. It's just so interesting, so enjoyable. That's the kind of interest and joy we want to bring into our meditation. And you notice that you're not, you don't have to strain to enjoy a book, to enjoy a movie or to enjoy music. You don't strain to do that. You don't get tense to do that. You just are absorbed in it because you're interested. And with the interest comes joy. So that's the way to think about meditation is, this is a piece of music without any notes. And I'm listening, absorbed in it. Uh, loving kindness is a pe grand piece of music without any notes. Yeah. 
Okay. Ajahn, our next question is from Huckleberry from British Columbia, Canada. I was not the most skilled parent with one of my children in particular, and I know I caused some harm to their psyche. I have been fairly burdened by guilt, which I am working to release. Now while I take now while I care deeply for this no longer child, they have trouble respecting me, and I find them very exhausting to be around at times because they can treat me harshly. What advice do you have moving forward with this young adult? Yes, uh, and I give this regularly to uh, parents of adult children. <laughs> adult children come and complain about their their upbringing and why you weren't this and why you were that and why you, why you were angry and why you weren't there and all this. And that. You've got to say, look, I'm your mother. I make cookies. If you want cookies, I'm the place to go. If you want psychological advice, I advise you to look in the yellow pages. <laughs> if you want spiritual advice, please find a good monk. <laughs> if you want, or a priest or whatever, do you want religious advice? I'm not the one to give it. Do you want uh, psychological consul consultation? I'm not the one to give it. I will make a cup of coffee for you. I will invite you to dinner. But you're looking in the wrong place for professional advice. And I, I don't do neurosurgery either. <laughs> so you just get the thing clear. Whatever, whatever lack of skill or whatever you didn't know at the time, it's, it's, it's all in the past and you're not the one to fix it. They need to fix it and they need to fix it by getting good advice from wise people and it doesn't mean you. So that's my advice to mothers and fathers of adult children who want to question their whole upbringing and everything. Just recommend that they go to somebody who specializes in that and that they work it out. Ajahn, our next question is from the live feed from Lake Strongheart. Dear Ajahn, is it correct to think of the blessings that you have spoken of so far as a doorway to Dhamma? Yes, this, all of these blessings are moving towards Dhamma and um, I don't want to give away the, uh, the final talks. So uh, let's, um, I guarantee that we're moving towards some very, very high blessings in life, the ultimate Dhammas. So this is a systematic process and progress towards the highest of the dhammas. Yes. Ajahn, our next question is from Charles Lee from New Mexico, United States. Do we have a responsibility to expose our parents to the dhamma? Um, well, fortunately we don't uh, because it's impossible sometimes. So we don't, we can't uh, control the world and we can't control our parents, etc. If the opportunity arises and they're receptive to it, it is a great gift to offer to your parents. And it is, as the, the Buddha says, it's, it's actually the greatest gift that you could possibly give to anybody, your friends, your relatives, your parents, your children. But they have to be asking for it. They have to be receiving it with open hands because it's not something that you can force feed into anybody. And it's a great mistake to, to make yourself uh, obnoxious to them by m wanting them to listen to you, you know. So whether we like it or not, we have something precious and valuable to, to offer somebody, but they have to be willing to take it. Uh, it is kind of like medicine where, uh, you know, if the, if the person is not willing to take the medicine, then uh, you can't force it on them. Ajahn, our next question is from the live feed from Um Ji. Dear Ajahn, if the universe punishes wrong conduct, why does cruelty towards children even exist? 
Yes, uh, yeah, it's a terrible sight. And in, uh, I think in all religious traditions, uh, there's a, a warning that, you know, the, the, the children, particularly innocent and, and harmless uh, and so vulnerable, are, it's a very great crime to, uh, to be cruel to children. And uh, but and you don't if you have a one life theory, uh, say you're a materialist, annihilationist, and that whatever is going to occur to a person occurs in this life, then it, it, it appears that the universe is completely unjust, very cruel and random, because terrible things are done to other other beings. So humans do terrible things to each other and to animals as well. And, and it seems that nothing happens to them. Sometimes they get away with it. They, nothing happens. Of course, in their, psychology, in, in their psyche, in their mind, uh, there, is, there has to be consequences. But it, you know, there are a lot of uh, very sadistic and pathological people who have done terrible things, and they don't seem to be suffering so much. They, of course, they are alienated and isolated from true humanity, but it doesn't seem uh, that there's much consequences to their terrible actions. So in, from a Buddhist point of view, uh, this is but one life. Now, sometimes terrible, uh, you, you, the universe does punish uh, evil people, uh, but t given enough time, the results come back. So it is that we don't escape the, the results of our negative actions uh, in, in, in this life or in future lives, and sometimes long in the future, negative results will arise. But this is the, in order for the universe to have some sort of lawful sense, you need a multi-life theory. It doesn't, ha doesn't appear to be have a just a sense if there is only one life, but on a multi-life uh, structure, if you could see the into the past and into the future, you would see that there is a law taking place um, in, in the universe. Yeah. Our next question is from Jim from British Columbia, Canada. My wife and 13-year-old son are both very supportive of my Buddhist practice, but neither has any interest in Buddhism for themselves. Do you have any suggestions for ways to share the Dhamma with them? I'm not looking to convert them. That is their choice. But I would like to make them aware of this wisdom that might greatly benefit them. Yeah, I think uh, Dhamma is not, uh, we're, you know, Buddhist words or Pali words, uh, it is instead of using the word, talking about metta, just just be loving to them, you know, just be kind and loving to them. And that is the lesson, that is Buddhism. If you're patient and uh, you react in interesting ways, in intelligent ways to the world around you, they will see that, that's the lesson. You are teaching them all the time by who you are. So don't worry about bringing the word Buddha into it or Dhamma into it or any of those things. Just be, be the Dhamma and you are, you are a walking teacher. And later on in life too, sometimes your children, they will have to uh, find their way through life and they might re suddenly remember, oh, my father, you know, he, he, he was very interested in Buddhism. I wonder what that is about. You know, they might be in their 20s and at loose ends and not trying to figure things out. And they think, well, let me just see what he was on about there. You know, what was he learning about? So sometimes it takes some time before they investigate it. Uh, but the best teaching for them is just to be a really good person. And that is, that is Dhamma. That is Buddhism. Ajahn, our next question is from the live feed from Nora. Dear Ajahn, your chanting yesterday touched the depths of my heart. I love to chant Namo Tassa, and now I have heard it differently. Is it possible to receive such great comfort from these words? Yeah. So th I think that's why 
there is such a thing as chanting. Uh, it we know that from music, like music, uh, songs and so forth, that it goes into another part of the brain. It's, it's very emotional. And people, even with Alzheimer's, they can remember the words to songs they learned when they were five years old, 10 years old, but they can't remember the name of uh, their favorite food. So there's some, it go, chanting brings uh, the words into a different area so that's more or less why we, we have chanting in the monastic tradition. And so, yes, uh, it can be very moving to hear chanting. And uh, that's just, the Namo Tassa has a bit of a melody to it. Um, and that's why it, it can stick with uh, some people. And it, and it appeals to some people to, to chant. Because when you chant in a monotone, it's, it's not, not appealing for a single note. It, nobody speaks that way. When, nobody speaks in a monotone. We we vary the tone uh, when we speak. So in chanting, I I think that it's it's helpful when the tone varies a little bit. And some people are very very moved by chanting. Very, uh, and it can really change the way your it can help your your meditation as well. So yes, uh, chanting is helpful and uh, I'm glad that you appreciate that. Our next question is from Rick in Indiana, United States. How do we skillfully practice the highest blessings with parents and children who actively lie, steal, engage in alcoholism, addiction, and abuse us and others? Can living an inspired practice of Dhamma be a skillful way to be of benefit to our unskillful family members? Yes, sometimes uh, it, you can be very effective. And, but you have to uh, show them that they are actually going to get the consequences of their own action. That you, it, it's not you that's going to get the consequences. They are. And that needs to be told to people. They're, People often get in this sort of situation where they're a little bit self-destructive or act out and everything. They think everybody else is going to pay more attention to them or et cetera. But you have to just explain to them and say, you know, it's not me that's going to get the results. It's you. If you keep that up, you will end up in a dark place. Not me, you. <laughs> not anybody else, you. And so it's up to you to find your way out of this. If you need my help, call me. If you're willing to make an effort, call me. If you're not willing to make an effort, don't call me. <laughs> I don't have time. I have a life as well. So I am there for you if you are willing to make an effort. If you're not, I will have a good life because of my dhamma, my skills, my efforts. And if you don't make effort, skillful effort, you won't have a good life and you will get the consequences. But you have a choice. But don't, don't uh, try my patience because I'm, that's not why I'm here. I, I'm a human that has a life ahead of them. So I'm going to make the best of it if you're willing to make effort, I'm there for you. Okay, one more question, I think. Ajahn, our final question is from the live feed from Laiety. Dear Ajahn, both my parents passed away. How do I repay my debt? Or what should I do through this blessing? Yes, uh, in, in Buddhism we have a very... We, what we do is we offer... Um, generosity in their name. So you can offer to a, a food bank, uh, you can do ch charity and uh, direct the positive, loving, generous energy to them wherever they are. So you can, you can establish a scholarship in their name or you can... Uh, so people come to the monastery and offer food to the monks and they request that the monks uh, 
chant for their parents uh, on a regular basis. And uh, so that we feel that the, the power of loving kindness and generosity is strong enough. It's like a microwave that can reach another planet. It, it goes right into the, the realm of the departed, uh, wherever they are. And most people, when, most people when they die are not ready to die. And they tend to linger in a, in a kind of a the realm of the departed. So they're, they're in a kind of a waiting station where they're not quite ready to move on. They haven't figured out what, where, they're, where they're going yet. And at that time, they can, they can really benefit and appreciate positive loving kindness and generosity done in their name. They, it's like sending a care package, uh, a Red Cross care package to, a, to a, a, a camp someplace, some sort of refugee camp. So you've been kicked out or a flood has come through and you're taken off to a refugee camp. And then people who halfway across the world, your relatives send you a care package. So that's the kind of uh, idea that in, in Buddhism is that send them care packages in the realm of the departed by just doing acts of generosity, um, some that they would appreciate. And everybody, of course, appreciates food and so forth. So you can, you can feed those who need food. Um, you can feed anybody. You can also just invite relatives over and share a meal in their name. Say, let's have a meal in the name of my mother, or my father. I, I want to, I want to invite you all to and have a special meal, thinking of my parents, and so that that's a way of doing it. Or go to a monastery and and offer it that way. So we will conclude today, and I will also. Um, let uh, Pia remind you of a few things now. Yeah. Thank you, Ajahn. A reminder that again tonight at 7 p.m. will be our meditation, and at 8.15 will be another Dhamma talk. Again, those are Pacific Standard Time. We'll have one more live tea time tomorrow, so if you'd like to submit questions in advance, be sure to use the form and the link that you'll find at the bottom of this description of this uh, YouTube live stream, as well as our website. And I wish you all a good evening and see you tomorrow. <laughs>